Um, okay, so our next speaker is Zhilong Lu, who is going to tell us about knockdown of long non-coding RNAs um, by CRISPR-I. Twenty percent of the mass and energy of the observed universe is made of dark matter. A large portion of our genome is made of biological dark matter, which is poorly understood. In the RNA world, only a small portion of them coding for proteins, and while the majority of them are non-coding RNAs. We know like small RNAs, like small nuclear RNAs, ribosome RNAs, uh, tRNAs, and microRNA, pyRNAs. But today I talk about a rather long, long non-coding RNA which is a small category here. And by definition, long non coding RNA are those longer than 200 nucleotide long. They function mostly in the nucleus, and they act as a regulator in cis or in trans for gene, replica uh, gene expression. And what most important about long non coding RNA is people have found some non coding RNA are transcript dependent, have transcript dependent function, but some of them have transcript independent function. And people also found long non can link to some disease like cancer or new, uh, neurodegenerative disorders. But the difficulty in the field is to still they have lack of a sufficient lack of a, a, a loss of function analysis. Really the challenge is how to uncouple the role of transcript from transcriptions. So if you look at these two panels, on the left, this means that cis regulatory is uh, really most uh, mediated by the uh, long non coding RNA product, means the transcript is very important. But on the right hand side, the transcription is very important, but the product is not important. How do you distinguish the two functions for some of the long non coding RNAs? And the current method, like many of them, are deletion of the DNAs, which is not very sufficient, and you couldn't distinguish between these transcripts and transcriptions. And people also can use RNAi, which can be uh, very efficient for a lot of uh, mRNAs. But for long term RNAs, some of them, many of them localize in the nucleus, which is not very efficient. Besides, for RNAi, you need to generate a product first, and then you degrade them later, which, again, you cannot distinguish transcription uh, and transcripts. So it really is a challenge in the field. So just taking advantage of what uh, people have done in the CRISPR uh, field, as you know, uh, we witnessed the explosion of CRISPR technology. And this is a very simple now, you think it's a very simple and also a very powerful system. So you have two uh, components. You have RNA, which is a guide RNA. Also you have a protein called uh, Cas9 in this case, which is a nucleus. Uh, nucleus, you can make a double strand break. And the double strand break can be repaired either by no homologue uh, end join or by uh, homology directed repair. Not only for genome editing, uh, CRISPR now has been used uh, for very different uh, purpose. For example, you can use inactive uh, nucleus Cas9, which we can call dead Cas9, which instead they not. Co uh, cut double strand uh, break, but you can use the guide RNA to bring the Cas9, dead Cas9, into a specific locus. You can either tag the Cas9 with GFP, as you can do the imaging, or you can do some uh, different kind of uh, block, like epigenetic modification, or uh, to block the RNA polymers too for transcription repressor or activator. So today I really just focus on this. Uh, transcription repressor by uh, blocking RNA polymers too. So the strategy is very uh, simple. So here, I show you in green, this uh, uh, dead Cas9, so it, it cannot cut uh, double, uh, the DNA, but it can be guided by single guide RNA to a specific site. So you can either at the upstream of the transcription start site, so which can block transcription initiation or you can have this uh, at the downstream of starting site, so you can block the translation or transcription elongation, or you can put them together, so it's kind of combination 
add up to block this transcription. And my lab, uh, a former graduate student co-supervised by my colleague, Chris Ponty and myself, a few years ago, uh, he identified more than 1,000 putative lung nonconnea in Drosophila. And then we use this as a preliminary data. We applied uh, ERC, European Research Council, uh, grant, which is a rather big grant. And one, of, one third of the work package is to try to use uh, Drosophila as a model system to tackle the function of lung nonconnea. But we faced a very difficult situation because we don't have enough mutant available for a lot of study. Instead, so former grad, uh, postdoc in my lab, Andrew Bossett, tried to generate, use CRISPR to, to study link RNA. But before that, we want to use a CRISPR to study protein coding gene. So that's why we end up in, uh, apply CRISPR uh, in, in fly for protein coding gene. But that's a rather, it's a, a not good strategy for the lab because after Andy published the paper, and he became very famous and been attracted by other labs and, and abandoned the Lanarkana project in the lab. And now he's in Sanger Institute uh, doing very well. But still, the lab, our purpose is to try to, to study Lanarkana AIDS. So we have another uh, uh, postdoc replace Andy and join the lab. And now we want really to use CRISPR to study Lanarkana A. To prove our principle, we select ROX1 which is the most studied lung coronary in Drosophila. Uh, for those who are not studying uh, ROX1, uh, just have a brief uh, introduction. This is a RNA on X, so it have two uh, transcripts. Uh, one is rather long, 35 uh, nucleotides long, another is 600 nucleotides long. So by itself, ROX1 or ROX2 mutant, they are viable. But if you combine together double mutant, you can uh, cause male lethal. But currently, the mutant for ROX1 or ROX2 either involved in deletion of the DNA or you have a very complex uh, chromosome rearrangement, rearrangement. So the strategy for us is really just to use CRISPR. Now we want to use first use a cell line to see whether you can use CRISPR interference to knock down ROX1 or ROX2. If we find some uh, good uh, gut RNA, then we apply that in vivo to generate trans transgenic flies either for ROX1 or for ROX2. Eventually, we want to combine them together by uh, just cross them together and see whether you can have this uh, male lethal phenotype. So this is just showing uh, we <coughs> really uh, Sanjie, the uh, poster in the lab, to put a single guard RNA, the dead cast down into one vector. And uh, they select, he selected quite a few guard RNA in the region. And by RTPCR, we found ROX1 region actually have two transcripts, so RA or RB. So you can see we can either have the gut RNA that uh, uh, the template or or non-template region. And just to make a long story short, so he select uh, eight of them, and some of them work, worked, but some of them not working. So you can see here one to six that rather poor uh, knocking down, but for uh, Number seven, we got 95% knocking down for ROX1. And uh, number eight, we got 85%. But it's uh, quite specific. So if you see the red for ROX2, there's nothing happened there. And he also did uh, uh, to use the Western blot to see the protein level of uh, dead Cas9. And you can see uh, the level of dead Cas9 is not uh, kind of have no correlation with the uh, knockdown, the effectiveness of knocking down. And then we wanted to see is that if you combine two, as I said before, you can combine uh, two gut RNA. And here's just a, as I, just a uh, repeat what we plan to do. And instead of you have a one gut RNA, now you're knocking, uh, I mean, you have another gut RNA uh, put in the same vector. And you can see number eight, seven plus number eight, you can have similar, very effective uh, knocking down, 95%. But interestingly, if here, you can see number four and number five. Individually, they couldn't get an effect knocked down, but by combining together, now you get 90% 90, 90 of knocking down, so, which is good, have some add-up effect. 
So use the same strategy. Now we combine uh, different cation A for uh, ROX2 as well. And in the, here you can see if by human dead cas now we couldn't get good GAT RNA, which uh, showing the effectiveness. In, but if we use Drosophila optimized dead cas now we get good combination, especially for the number B uh, and C. So now what we have achieved is to in a stable cell line, which is clone 8, because that clone 8 cell line can express both uh, ROX1 and uh, ROX2. And we can get some combination of uh, GAD on it can knock on them individually. And what we use uh, next is to apply this method in to, uh, to generate transgenic flies. And here just uh, showing this uh, vector, uh, which we use to inject into fly embryos. And we can uh, get very good knockdown for ROX1, showing in here. I don't know what's that. Yeah, here's uh, the ROX1 knocking down. And also have a good knockdown for ROX2. Uh, so this is two different lines. And we can see a dead cas express in the flies, which means it's not very toxic. So it's not affected survival. As expected, single uh, uh, knocking down in the flies have no uh, obvious phenotype. So they are viable. Now very important moment. So we want to see if you cross them together and what happened. So from what we know about ROX1 and ROX2, if you have a double mutant, and you should expect to have a male lethal phenotype. And the truth, uh, the data really uh, confirm uh, a previous study. So yellow white, you get 50% of a male, but in the double mutant, you only get 7%. Those are escapers that we look them the phenotypes are normal. So this suggests uh, now we, we can do a double mutant, which is knocking down both ROX1 and ROX2 in the flies. We found uh, the male lethal, so, which is a very good suggest. CRISPR interference it can be very effective uh, in vivo as well. Just to summarize what I told you uh, today, and I think uh, CRISPR interference is very effective to replacing transcription of long long in cell lines, also in vivo. And most importantly, I think this can be used for pro promoter mapping, and it can be accompanying the role of transcription from the RNA, from the product. And of course, it, uh, we, uh, we show CRISPR interference can be used for uh, modified gene expression in vivo. And I just want to thank uh, uh, Sanjay Ghosh, the major contributor for this project, who is uh, in the front row. And Charlotte Tibbet uh, helping him, but Charlotte is not on the picture. And Andy Bossett is the person who developed CRISPR in the first place. But now he ended up uh, have a lab in Sanger Institute. And Yong is a student uh, in the lab to continue the CRISPR interference. And we also have a website, Oxford CRISPR, if you're interested in the uh, detailed protocol. And this study is uh, fun funded by MRC also by European Research Council. And finally, I want to just have one slide. And after staying in Oxford for nine years, now I'm relocating my lab into Shanghai, uh, a rather a little bigger uh, city. And I'm moving from one of the oldest universities to one of the, two, one of the youngest universities uh, in the world. I feel quite excited about that. So if you are in interested in the potential like join to my lab, you can either scan this QR code, or you can stop by the posters, uh, which I will be there uh, in the afternoon. And thank you for your attention. Okay, um, I, I would like to ask, actually ask you a question. So how much of the variability um, that you see between the effectiveness of guide RNAs do you think has to do with where they were located versus the quality of, the efficiency of binding, for example? Yeah, I think we still have a, not fully understand what, what kind of a guide RNA will be useful. So it's still like try and, and see the result. But uh, from what we limited to result, it looks like if you have the guide RNA cross to the starting side, which seems very effective. And also we try to put them apart at least 30 uh, 
nucleotide apart from each other. Otherwise, you will be too crowded there.